Welcome into another episode of Coasting, presented by Flow Hockey TV. I'm Evan Pivnik, joined as always by, well, the voice now of the Iowa Heartlanders, David Fine. Very special guest today here on Coasting. He is the TV voice of the Pittsburgh Penguins in the National Hockey League. He spent some time in the Central Hockey League before he got the call up to the NHL. It's Steve Mears. Steve, thanks so much for joining us here in Coasting. How's everything going? Everything's great. I uh, wish we were still doing some playoff hockey, but unfortunately uh, our season came to an end in Pittsburgh after the first round, uh, but it's great to be on with you. Thanks for having me. Definitely. And, you know, Steve, uh, normally in an NHL season, 82 games and then playoffs, um, which the Penguins are certainly accustomed to. This year it was a little bit more of a sprint mentality. So how long has it taken for your uh, uh, emotions and your excitement to kind of dim down into off-season mode, perhaps compared to a normal 82-game uh, season? Yeah, it was, it was definitely a grind uh, to cram in those 56 games in that short amount of time. Uh, there's never been anything like it, and especially given the circumstances that we have all dealt with the various challenges uh, during a pandemic and, and trying to conclude the season. Luckily, it, it was a case where the Penguins did a great job and uh, their staff uh, with all of the different challenges and the testing that went on. And luckily they were a team that did not have many COVID issues during the course of their season. Uh, so we completed the regular season and then in the first round of the playoffs, the Penguins uh, just didn't have it against the New York Islanders. And, and we can discuss that further. But, uh, yeah, it was a disappointing end, I think, mostly because it was a it was a very successful regular season. The team played extremely well. They won the division. There was a lot to like. They exceeded expectations. And I think a lot of people, there were some who didn't even have them making the playoffs this year. And it turns out they win the division, have a great year with all the challenges, a lot of injuries, too. And unfortunately, though, uh, losing in six games uh, with the expectations being as high as they are in Pittsburgh, it was just a, a very quick and a disappointing conclusion to the season. But how excited does that make you for next season, knowing that hopefully all most of the restrictions will be lifted? Maybe you can get back on the road with the team and have a little more of a, a better broadcasting experience. What are you looking forward to the most for next season? Yeah, I, I love to travel, so uh, that, that would be one thing, getting back on the road and going to some of these fantastic cities and the, just the, the game day routine of being on the road, being at the hotel, going to the morning skate, and maybe talking to the players face-to-face, -face, which is something we haven't done now in uh, well over a calendar year, and the coaches. So uh, I'm looking forward to that aspect. And, yes, some of the other things about the broadcast themselves – actually being at the venue on the road as opposed to being in a studio and calling the game off of a monitor, um, all of those things. And, and there are things that we took for granted, just uh, being around the team and uh, going on a road trip, even if it wasn't the most exciting city, just to be in that environment, immersed with the team. We're traveling on the team plane. We're in the team hotel. And I really missed that. So uh, as much as uh, I enjoy the travel, I also enjoy just the, the art of play-by-play -play and, and being at the venue and calling the games there, hearing the noise from a sellout crowd, feeling that emotion and that energy that's in the building, especially this time of year. And luckily now we're starting to see that in some various venues that we're seeing bigger crowds and you're seeing that reaction whenever a big goal is scored. And uh, there's nothing like it, playoff hockey, nothing like it. You have to experience it live and in person and with a packed house, preferably. So uh, we're looking forward to getting back to 18,000 in Pittsburgh. Calling a game off of a monitor for you. Was that something that you actually did in the past when you worked at NHL Network doing some of the, the world juniors games or were you in attendance there? Did you have any sort of previous experience calling games off of a monitor? I did the world juniors. That was it. Uh, I did five world juniors in total. Three of them were in Europe. We didn't go to Europe. So we did those games off a monitor in a studio. So I had a lot of, preparation there it was really helpful too i knew what to expect going into it because we did those games and those world junior games are particularly difficult because you have rosters that you've never seen most of these players before some of the ones in the united states uh, you have but uh, you're talking about a lot of players you've never seen before so it's a challenge to begin with and then for those three world juniors that i did uh doing the games off the monitor I knew what to expect. I knew what I wanted to have as far as the setup and the size of the monitor and the various views that you need. If you're going to do something like that, there's no question 
it's hard because for a couple of reasons, you don't have your peripheral vision. You can't see what's happening behind the play. You can't see when the trail referee has his arm up in the air to call a penalty, or if the team is pulling the goaltender, something's happening behind the play out of the view of the camera, the main camera. And then just the fact that, as I alluded to earlier, you're not immersed with the team. So you're not getting the opportunity to speak with the team off the air, off the off the record with uh, talking with players and coaches. And we all know that's when you get the best stuff is when there's no cameras and no microphones involved. So to not have those off air conversations, I think that was really missed too. So there, there are a couple of different areas that make it difficult, but I'm hoping we never have to do that again. And uh, at the same time though, the people at at t sports net, they made the most of it. We had a beautiful studio. I don't think you could do it any better than what we did as far as the technical setup and having the different monitors and using the ceiling to floor monitor that we had, the backdrop, uh, we call it the hub. And uh, I think they did a great job with the execution of it. But as I said, hopefully never have to do it again and we can be at the arena now moving forward from here on out. Before we get into your background in broadcasting, I was intrigued that uh, I'm a big tennis fan and you did some of the U.S. Open too uh, in 2020 U.S. Open. So how did that opportunity come along and were there any other opportunities that you had a chance uh, during the course of a quarantine and the pandemic before the Penguins got going? Yeah, that was something really cool. I, I think we all during the pandemic uh, hopefully tried something new, whether it was a hobby or uh, just did something productive in that time whether it's reading a book or a new musical instrument or something, anything, you know, hopefully uh, everybody that's listening was able to do that. And then you can still go out and do those things. It's not like it was just pandemic exclusive, but uh, that was one of them. Someone reached out and uh, wondered if I was interested in tennis. And I have been a big fan of the sport since I was younger and the, the days of Sampras and Agassi and Steffi Graf and all the legendary players when I was younger. So uh, I was really excited to, to be able to do something like that at such a big event. I lived in New York for five years and uh, actually never went to the U.S. Open because I was always on vacation or getting ready for hockey season, but I always followed it and it was so cool. It was actually surreal being there last year because there were no fans. So my first U.S. Open broadcast experience was in this setting where I had, it felt like the whole stadium to myself. There's nobody else there watching these great players. And uh, you're getting, you're right there in the front row. And they actually wanted people like myself, media members or staff members. The players said they, they wanted some people in the, in the seats just to give it some type of an atmosphere. And uh, so there wasn't just total silence out there. So uh, we were encouraged to go sit and watch and sit in the front row and wear our masks. And it was just uh, such a cool experience. Another thing that I hope never happens again, I'm looking forward to doing it again this year, but with fans in attendance there in New York, but uh, it was really cool. Talk about a, a sport completely opposite from hockey and broadcasting. Uh, yeah, it's uh, you, don't, you don't even speak during the point, really. And uh, in, in hockey on television, it's almost like a radio call where there are a lot of things that you're describing. And in other sports, you wouldn't have that type of pinpoint description, um, like in baseball, for example. But in hockey, there is a little bit of that, that tape to tape. Uh, and you're describing some of the things, not everything, but some of the things that the viewers can see. But that's part of the style of, of doing television play by play with the game of hockey. And that's so different. And tennis is just the complete opposite. You're like a traffic cop and you're trying to pull from the expertise of your analyst who's there. And I got to work with some great ones. Was it always hockey for you growing up when you wanted to become a broadcaster? I know growing up in, I know Finer wants to talk about uh, more of the Western PA scene uh, in a little bit, but for you, obviously growing up being a Pittsburgh sports fan, was it always hockey that you gravitated for broadcasting or do you see yourself maybe doing some football, maybe doing some baseball? It was always hockey. And then the biggest reason was Mike Lang. I mean, he's my idol. He's the, the greatest and the hall of fame voice of the Penguins for those who don't know for 45 years. So I just wanted to be like him. I was a fan of the other sports. If you grew up in Pittsburgh, you have to be It's in your DNA Steelers, pirates, and yes, the Penguins, and also the confluence of events that the Penguins happened to be the team in the city that was having the most success when I was at that impressionable age, 10, 11 years old. They went back-to-back -back Stanley Cups. They have the best player in Mario Lemieux. They have the best broadcaster in Mike Lang. They have a host of other Hall of Fame players like Paul Coffey and Yarmer Yager and Ron Francis and Larry Murphy. So uh, that confluence of events 
it all just kind of uh, gelled for me to become a hockey broadcaster first and foremost. And uh, when I was out playing baseball or uh, doing video game baseball or video game football, there I was doing a little bit of announcing of that as well, but it was always hockey uh, announcing while I played dr driveway hockey, announcing while I played the video games on what was back then, Sega Genesis. And uh, there's my age right there. So like PlayStation <laughs> 1, and now it's like, what is it, PS5, I think. So, uh, yeah, it was a long time ago, but uh, I think that was always what I wanted to do. Since I was 10 years old, that was the one thing I wanted to do. And I always speak to students. And we have a broadcasting program, and I am always talking to broadcasting students. And uh, as I got into getting started in my career, I kept that same mentality of hockey play by play. That's what I want to do. And in hindsight, that was unbelievably stupid. And I tell all those students that all the time that I put all my eggs in the hockey play by play basket and it worked out. And I'm very fortunate for that. But how foolish was that um, where I should have been doing way more as far as other sports and other media and different skills like interviewing and hosting and reporting and, and, and wanting to do all those things. But I just was so set on hockey play by play. Very thankful that it worked out. But uh, if I had to do it over again, I definitely would have been more diverse in my skills and uh, in the development there along the way. Luckily, I've had some opportunities to do some other things like the U.S. Open or uh, working at MLB Network and and uh, even though I was a rookie in both those instances, I was able to pull from some other skills and uh, get involved. And people were patient with me and gave me some opportunities. I had the opportunity to live in Reading before moving out here to Iowa City with the Reading Royals and the ECHL. And uh, so I got the I got the PA feel, uh, learned a little bit about Westmoreland County where you grew up. What's the somebody that grows up in in Western PA? It's a little bit different than Southeastern PA. So how would you describe someone from Westmoreland County, you know, sort of the Pittsburgh, su Pittsburgh suburbs, greater Pittsburgh suburbs area? Well, the first thing that comes to mind is sports. And uh, we're, we're talking about it here, but that's the truth that uh, you grow up being surrounded by Steelers, high school football. You've got Pitt and Penn State athletics. You've got the Pirates. And they've been around for over 100 years. You've got, you've got generations of Pirate fans and a beautiful ballpark here. You've got the Penguins now who are right up there with the Steelers as far as the gold standard and, and the, the expectations being high for winning a championship. And the Penguins have been one of the most successful franchises in the expansion era with five cups. So that's the thing here in Pittsburgh. It's all about sports and, and playing youth sports too and deck hockey and street hockey and and all those other things. So I, I think it's just such a wonderful sports town. I'm biased, but I think it's the best sports town in America. And it was funny when I went to New York, you get to know, you live in New York City, there's a lot going on to say the least. I mean, people have a whole bunch of different interests, the whole spectrum of, of interests and uh, hobbies and, and professions and cultures. So uh, there's a lot going on in New York to say the very least. And uh, one of the things you, you meet, at, you meet different people and you learn that uh, not everybody is in the sports, which is like shocking for someone from Pittsburgh. And then I, I would meet someone and I would say, I work for NHL Network. And they would say, what's that? And uh, you'd have to explain to them in New York that it's a, it's a channel that has just hockey. And I and I, they, the person would be like, so you're telling me there's a channel on TV that only talks about hockey? Like, yes, it's a hockey. Like, all the sports have a channel. There's a tennis channel. There's NFL Network. There's MLB Network. But unlike Pittsburgh, New York, and uh, other larger cities, other parts of the country, they aren't uh, – not every single person is going to be well-versed in every single sport. I mean, it's just a, a byproduct of uh, going to such a, a big city and a big market. So I thought that was interesting as a Pittsburgher, like everyone knows Mario Lemieux and Sidney Crosby. Everybody in the city knows who they are and knows at least something about Ben Roethlisberger and all the other great Pittsburgh sports legends. But in other places, it may not be as much at the forefront. That was kind of something unique when I moved away from here. So growing up in Pittsburgh and then you go to, as we say, the Bowling Green State University, uh, fellow Falcon, I got my bowling green sweatshirt on here to you know nice. to, to cheer on the the brown and orange uh not too far from pittsburgh bowling green and you end up taking the helm and becoming the play-by-play -play 
voice for the Falcons as a student. Kind of take me through your decision to go there, because as we know, in broadcasting, growing up, trying to find a school, you know, there's obviously Syracuse, David went to, and there's also places besides Syracuse, David. I don't know if you know that as well, like Bowling Green State I'm, University. I've become aware of that through you <laughs> and through others. I, I've learned that there's a little bit wider spectrum, and I know Bowling Green, uh, yourself, Steve, uh, Everett Fitzhugh, and a number of others are, uh, are making it proud. But anyway, go ahead. Yeah, just the, the how, did the, how did you come to the decision to, uh, to become a Falcon? It all came back to that mission of wanting to be a play-by-play guy in the NHL. That was the main reason. And I eventually went to visit the campus. I visited Syracuse too. And I thought it was nice, but I went to Bowling Green and was just captivated. And uh, no offense, I mean, both are great schools, but I went to BG and it was closer to Pittsburgh and, and just the small town atmosphere, the dorms, the, the, the little main street, and I knew, and the hockey program, I, I knew, I knew of Bowling Green hockey because I was a hockey fan. I had heard Rob Blake and, and Mike Johnson and Brian Holzinger and all these other great players had played there. So just from being a hockey fan, I knew of the school and that's why it was on my radar. And then I went and applied and went to visit and it was only four hours away. It was an easy drive. And then you see that they've got a division one hockey program and a great broadcasting program and maybe I would have the chance to call games there and see players who would graduate to the NHL, which I did. I was very lucky. Uh, that was it. I, I, that was the only one that I, I think I, that was the only school I formally applied to. I looked at some other ones in addition to Syracuse and Ohio University and but Bowling Green. It was like, that was, that was a no brainer for me. So uh, I was able to, to go there and right away, freshman year, I'm getting to do games and uh, that's unheard of. And I'm, I'm calling names that you know, guys that went on to have really good NHL careers like Ryan Miller and Mike Comrie and Mike Camilleri. So uh, talk about an amazing experience and a foundation that's set for your career, getting that hands-on experience at a young age, freshman year, by the sophomore year, I was doing, I think, all the games. And then junior and senior year, I did almost all the games. So uh, to be able to get that type of hands-on experience, it, I don't know if you get that anywhere else. And then to see the caliber of players that I saw, we had Kevin Bieksa who went on to have a great career. Now I really know I'm getting old because some of these guys like Ryan Miller are retiring now or are retired. And uh, I can say I called their games in college, watched them in the NHL, and now they've moved on to another phase in life. But uh, it was, uh, it was a, a, such a cool experience and uh, worked with some wonderful people there. It was uh, just, I could not have, scripted it any better I don't know what more I could have gotten other than going back to what I said before should have been doing way more than just Falcon hockey while I was there I should have been doing BG24 television news and should have been doing writing for the newspaper I should have dabbled in all those things I didn't and uh, very lucky that it worked out but I, I reiterate to all the students that I speak to especially if you're in college that's the time try everything Try volleyball, basketball. You may not be a fan. You never know where the jobs are going to be. All those are those Olympic sports like volleyball or swimming or whatever it might be. Those sports do get broadcast and maybe you'll have something you can put on a resume somewhere down the road. And that's where the work is going to be. So that's what I try to, to really emphasize when I speak to students and uh, you just can't say it enough. So uh, yeah, at, at BG, I should have been doing more, but the hockey portion couldn't be any better. It was absolutely phenomenal. Let's talk a little more BG here just to make David upset that we're not talking about Syracuse. Uh, <laughs> so what was the freshman dorm for you? Did you live on campus, you know, off campus during your senior year? What was your, your residential experience like? Two years at Rogers Quad, which is no longer around, I believe, or has been rebuilt, I think. Uh, you can correct me on that one. Is it even called? There's a, the structure is there, but it's not Rogers Quad. So I'm trying to think of the quad. So there, when I was there, it was Harshman and Kreischer. They're, right. they're called. So it's like, arena, yeah. Yeah. So like the two ones that are exactly the same, but one has a dining hall, I think in it. The other one doesn't. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and then, well, was the, the, was the one Rogers and then Cole were it's more toward the middle of campus yes. a further in. And uh, I do know that Rogers was taken down and I believe it was the last time I was there, would have been like 2013 and uh, if i'm not mistaken there's something else there now it's been a while i gotta go back 
I really should. I want to go back for a hockey game, but I'm obviously busy with my own hockey team here. But uh, yeah, some some great memories, and it was just uh, it was so cool. And then two years on campus, two years off campus, and just life comes into focus. You learn so much. I I can't tell you the thing that some of the things that I learned in geology class or or uh, some of the other courses that I took, although those were really helpful and very interesting. I remember taking one class just about World War One and learning all about World War One. I. I mean, just so many cool courses that I took there. But the most important thing were the life lessons. And I think that's the case for everybody when you get to college and, and just life comes into focus. You learn about people and you learn about relationships and, uh, and trying to navigate this world. And, and that's what I did, especially in those years in the dorm. That's, uh, that's where you have those formative years, I think, as a person. So from there, you move south and way south of Pittsburgh and way south of, uh, of Bowling Green, um, and you end up down near Shreveport, Louisiana. And I remember when I was moving west to Kearney, Nebraska, the USHL's Tri-City Storm, um, that, you know, I'm from the East Coast originally, and it's like, where am I going? I've never been to this part of the country. I don't know anyone. I don't have a place to live. I'm going to just try to figure it out from scratch um, right after graduating. So from your experience how did you end up getting the job down in Louisiana what were some of those cultural shockers if any um, that you had along the way and you know sort of those first few months um, if you could take us back into your mindset and what was going on then very similar what you just described uh, you're going into the great wide open uh, Tom Petty song that's like you're going in there and you have no idea what to expect and it's unnerving when you're 22 years old, you're packing up your car, just graduated from college and driving down from Pittsburgh, where I was living to Shreveport, Louisiana, having never been there before, totally different culture, totally different pace of life, different food. And you know, nobody, everybody's a stranger. So to go through that, and that that's difficult and, it, and it's challenging and uh, it takes some time to get settled in and it's intimidating and, and you're just trying and I'm not like an overly especially back then not an overly outgoing person so uh, you're trying to meet new people and you're trying to uh, just be welcomed into this group not only the team itself but the office staff and, and you're just trying to get acquainted with everyone and everything and it was hard it was difficult very challenging just to, to get settled but it turned out to be the greatest four years of my life. And a lot of the people that I worked with from players to the coach, to the general manager, to the other people in the office staff, they're still great friends, booster club members, fan base, and uh, some of the, the diehard fans there. They're still people that I keep in touch with. And it was the greatest four years. As I said, I, it was all fun. Everything about it was fun. There, even the, the bus ride and arriving at 4 a.m. in Odessa, Texas, and helping the equipment manager and the athletic trainer unload the gear when it was freezing cold, carrying this heavy skate sharpener into some rodeo barn, which was a hockey rink in Odessa, so we could take on the Odessa Jackalopes that day in our third game in three nights. I don't know how the players did it. Um, all of it was fun. It was That's the best way to describe it. And that's part of just being a, a part of a team in your early 20s and not getting paid a whole lot but it's just such a great time in life and uh, to, to learn, I call it getting my master's in hockey, learn about the business side of the sport. You're learning about sales, you're learning about marketing, team services, press releases, media guides, uh, holding a press conference and then broadcasting is like five to 10% of the job. And then a lot of times it's like, oh, seven o'clock's here, gotta go do the game. And you would go broadcast, but you were honing all those skills and you're learning so much more than just play by play and you're developing relationships. So uh, I was really lucky that uh, the, uh, this is another BG connection and, and uh, another example of how small the sports world is and the sports broadcasting world is. I always say list your references on your resume. One of the references I put was Dave Smith, who was the assistant coach of the Falcon hockey team at Bowling Green. It turned out the general manager of the Mudbugs went to college with Dave Smith, the assistant coach at Bowling Green. So he put in a good word for me and they went with me for the job and uh, the rest is history. It's, uh, it's a perfect example of why you should always focus on networking and listing those references and you never know who knows someone and, 
it was always that game I was always trying to play. Okay, well, this guy went here. Maybe he knows this person. You're just like trying to connect the dots all the way. And that's how eventually uh, I approached it when trying to get a job at a higher level is that you're just trying to network and, and everybody knows someone. It's, it's amazing how small the sports world is. And then you're starting to narrow it even more when you're talking about hockey and hockey broadcasting. It's a tiny, tiny sports world. And uh, you'd be surprised at uh, how many people know someone that you know that might be able to put on a good word for you. I'm curious too, because one of the things that you said that stuck out to me a, a lot based on experiences that Evan and I have had is the importance of, you said, you know, you had fun down in Shreveport and starting out, ending up with the right organization is something that's hugely important. If you're in your early twenties and you end up with a team that might not survive for the entire time that you're there, or, you know, it could be tough on other ends, or there's some, you know, the expectations for someone that's 22 or 23, um, it could be a career killer or a career staller. So the experience that you had, I know you mentioned the coach there. I think Scott Musket was his name, if I'm remembering yeah. right. Um, what was your relationship like with those individual individual actors, the GM, the president, the coach, um, that, that were so hugely important to your development? They were always so helpful. It was incredible that they were willing uh, to help me out. And they, they realized, every one of them, they said it word for word, that if, if you pursue and were to get a job at a higher level, that's a feather in our cap. So we're going to do everything we can to get you to the next level. And they had that approach with players. They had that approach with other members of the staff, whether it was coaches or, or training staff and the broadcaster as well. They, as much as they didn't want to lose me at any point, they said, we want you to fulfill your dreams and we want to see you get to that next level. And I know they're proud of me that I was able to go from there to the, the New York Islanders. And, and they were when I got that job. And, and, uh, and the best thing is that they're just such good friends and that those relationships I'll have for the rest of my life. I still keep in touch. I was just texting with the GM yesterday about something and we were joking around and, and uh, Jason Rent is his name. And now he's involved in a junior team in Wichita Falls, Texas. And uh, it's, it's so that's the most important thing that you're building those relationships and, and there are people that you will be friends with for life. Here in the NHL, the players, like say Sidney Crosby and Evgeny Malkin, it's not like I'm going out and having beers and having dinner with them on the road. Or like there's definitely a separation big time where you're a media member as the broadcaster here and the players are the players and, and they have their own world going on in, in some way. So the, you're never going to have that camaraderie where in Shreveport, I was part of the team. The guys would ask me, hey, where are we going? Where, what are we doing tonight? We're going out after the game. Like they would ask me. They would invite me, and we would go hang out and do all those things. Uh, I always knew that like, they trusted me. That The telltale sign was when they invited me to go out the night before a game, secretly. They told me, hey, let's, uh, we're going to go out 9 o'clock, just uh, meet around the corner, and uh, we'll go out the night before a game, which they were not allowed to do. But that's how I knew that they trusted me, that, that, that they would invite me to do that. That's not happening in the NHL at all. Not only are they not going out for the game, they sure as hell aren't inviting me, even if they were. Uh, so there's that difference. And that's, like, that's the, a part of uh, minor league hockey and, and uh, just that, that lifestyle that I love so much. It's a shame. I wish there was a way you could have the best of both worlds, right? You get the money and, and the, the – playing just being a part of the NHL atmosphere and the big crowd and the big arena and, and the big stage and all those things. Uh, it'd be nice to have that and still have the quaint, the small town, uh, you know, camaraderie with, uh, with the minor league hockey and, and I had in the CHL, but that's just the way life goes. You trade up as you, you trade up and uh, as you trade off, as you trade up and you move up in the ladder in the NHL and you don't have some of those things that, uh, you really thought were a big part of uh, just the experience and just the, the joy of being uh, in Shreveport and being in the CHL. So you were talking about before, obviously we, we all know it, riding the buses, getting into cities at 4 a.m., unpacking gear. But for you, when you first started doing that, um, you know, because you luckily in, in college at Bowling Green, you know, you don't really have to do a lot of that stuff. Thankfully for Scott Scooter, Jess and, and his staff, they were fantastic. Uh, 
But what was like the moment for you when you were in the pros and riding around buses that kind of was like your welcome to the minors moment? It's kind of like, you know, what, you know, you didn't wear the right thing to a certain event or you didn't show up on time or something like that. Was there a moment for you where it kind of just like woke you up and said, well, I'm not in college anymore. This is, this is professional hockey. Yeah. There were, there were a bunch of things that have, I mean, there are so many wild things that happen in that level that I think people don't realize happen. I mean, they, they, they did back then, and the one that jumps out of mind immediately is the two coaches fighting on the ice in their suits. That that was like a slap shot moment. People think that, oh, that's slap shot. That's in the 70s, these line brawls and uh, these guys with 400 penalty minutes. No, that really happened. Not only did two coaches fight once in Wichita, Kansas, but you had some unbelievably tough customers that were so terrifying out on the eye. And, and there was like no, hardly any repercussions. So you got like a 400 penalty minute lunatic who might do a, a, like a baseball swing with a stick and really injure somebody that could happen. Or he's going to drop the glove and just pummel you for no reason on the ice. Like something like that could happen. It's not just slap shot from the seventies. That was kind of the reality. I don't think it's quite there here. I know there's some, there's obviously fighting at all levels of hockey, but things have evolved. So even over the last 15 years, there have obviously been a lot of changes and those changes are for the good. But uh, back then there were so many of those types of moments that if you told someone that, uh, it, oh, it's, it's like slap shot, that's, that's when it happened, it was in the seventies, they would believe that and they wouldn't think that it was 2004 and like fairly modern professional hockey. And you have things like coaches getting in fights on the ice and there's like huge line brawls and police happen to be involved and and this like some of the craziness and then there's all this, obviously the other stuff that i can't even mention but uh there are a lot of different things that that uh really are so surreal to think that that happened and uh i talked about it with josh bograd who's the, the tv voice of the dallas stars and he was in this league at the same time i was he was with the corpus christi rays and uh, we were talking one time last year and just thinking like we were just sharing stories like that and we're thinking like we actually lived through that like that happened and uh and people don't, sometimes may not believe it but um for, as far as me personally i think just the the usual stuff of like setting up the gear the radio equipment and going into some of these barns where you're having to climb up a ladder and go into some type of catwalk and and run cables all the way through the stands and and like all those things are kind of like welcome to the miners moments and and uh, the unloading the gear, that, that to me was one of the most rewarding things. And I wasn't really all that willing to do it right away because I'm like, why am I, I'm the radio guy? Why do I have to do this? But uh, it turned out it was one of the most rewarding things because I felt like I was helping the team in a tangible way. And the players were able to go sleep in the hotel. And I was there at four in the morning, like I said, Odessa, Texas, unloading the gear, helping out the equipment manager, helping out the, the trainer. And it was another part of that bonding experience with not only them, but the entire team. And I know the players appreciated that. And uh, I felt like I was more invested in the team and their success when I had a tangible contribution, like unloading the gear and helping to hang up the equipment, and getting the locker room ready. You can't just snap your fingers and end up in the NHL. It takes years, um, it takes years of networking, years of work at your craft. So before you even got the job, what were you doing as the lead up to that uh, in the months before you even had your first interview to ensure that you would be able to potentially have an interview and you would be able to do the right things to end up uh, with a radio job in the National Hockey League? Yeah, I was always networking, playing that game. Like I said, that connect the dots. And this person knows this person. Maybe they know this person. It was always that game in the off season. And uh, it was constant scouring the internet making some phone calls, just introducing myself and letting them know I exist down here in Shreveport, Louisiana, and I'm someone who wants to move up to the next step, even if it means taking a pay cut or, or taking a side job and, and, uh, and doing whatever it took to get to that next level. So I was really dedicated and, and uh, passionate about moving up that ladder. And there was one opening. It was in Bridgeport in the American Hockey League. I wanted to throw my name in the mix. And I did so, and I got pretty far as far as the networking, getting in touch with people and trying to make these phone calls. And, and, uh, and sure enough, along the way, the New York Islanders radio job came open. John Weideman went from the Islanders to Chicago, where he still is doing Blackhawks radio. 
And so already I have a foot in the door with the Islanders organization. Bridgeport was affiliated and, and still is affiliated with the Islanders. So that was just the, another confluence. And, and we talk about timing and luck and how a, just a huge part of life and, and in any career path, you have to have those elements. I always say timing, luck, and talent. I don't know what the proportions are, or what the priorities are with those, but you've got, you have to have a little bit of all of them. So uh, there's an example of timing where I'm going after a Bridgeport job and it turns out their parent company or parent team ends up uh, with a radio opening. And, uh, and I think they were in the market for someone who was young and, and wasn't gonna cost a whole lot of money and that they could kind of mold and, and might be someone who was up and coming. And, and it turned out to be just a, a perfect stepping stone type job or an introduction into the NHL because I'm going into a big market and I'm surrounded by the greatest people you could ever ask for. Howie Rose and Billy Jaffe are doing the television side at the time. I'm working with Chris King, who still does Islanders radio, and he's a dear friend to this day. Uh, and then Doc Emmerich is doing the Devils, and Sam Rosen is doing the Rangers, and Kenny Albert's doing the Rangers. So we're seeing those guys. At that time, it was eight times a year we'd play those teams. So I'm just immersed, just surrounded by all these legends, and they couldn't be nicer. You see why they're successful and why they're at the level that they're at, because they're so kind and willing to help out someone who's young and coming into the league. and and uh, so welcoming. So to be able to get to know all of those people and for them to take me under their wing and to teach me all the things that I needed to learn. And I needed to learn a lot. I, you think because you're a big fish in a small pond in Shreveport, you think, oh, I got it all covered. You know, all oh, the people in Shreveport love me. So I'm going to go here and they're going to love me too. And I had a million things I had to learn. And, uh, and that was eye-opening. And that wasn't even close to the level that I needed to be to be, for, to, to be a successful New York big league radio broadcaster and doing a radio style as opposed to a TV style. They were all things that I had to learn. And, and luckily, Howie Rose was a great teacher and Chris King was a great teacher and all those other names that I mentioned. Like I was trying to be a sponge around them. I was receptive to what they said and they would give me little bits of advice. And uh, I'll always be grateful for what they uh, provided to me when I was at a, a really young age, just starting out in the NHL, where at first you think you know, but you really don't have any clue. You really uh, have a lot to learn. And I still think that to this day. And that's another thing I try to tell students is that you're always trying to improve. You're always trying to get better, whatever field it is, always trying to learn. So here I am now, what, 15 years into the NHL, four years into this job, and I still think I have a lot of room for improvement and I'm always trying to get better. I think we should all take that approach. I think the, one of the most amazing things that stuck out, stuck out to me to that story there is that you were applying for the AHL job and all of a sudden, oh, I might as well just take the NHL job. I mean, that, is that when you're looking back on that and seeing how things kind of work a little bit now in terms of moving up and moving around to different leagues, is that like kind of astonishing to you that that all kind of worked out the way it did? Sure. Yeah. A lot of these, these things, these circumstances. And I bet if you asked Doc Emmerich or you asked any of those other names, the legendary names, and you talk about that lineage and all the pathway of all the things that had to happen for them to arrive at wherever it was that they were at or are at. Uh, yeah. It's an amazing thing. And, and that goes back to what I said about timing and luck. And so you have to keep that in mind and you have to be patient too. So um, that, yeah, that you think about, what are the odds of me being the TV announcer for the Penguins? I am a diehard Penguin fan growing up here. Nothing special about me. I mean, you know, it's not like uh, my dad was a famous NHL coach who knew everybody with the Pens organization or, you know, something like that. It was just, it's just luck. And it was just this confluence. So uh, I, I, I say that all the time. It's, it's, it's really incredible when you think about what are the odds? There's only one Penguin TV play-by-play -play job. It doesn't change hands very often. And I was just a fan. I was just a kid who loved the Penguins in 91 and 92. And all these other things came together. And I take all these stepping stones. And you, you think like, if one thing had happened differently, my life would totally be completely different if something else had misfired or, or some other thing. And it's just kind of the cosmic uh, forces that uh, come together. And, and uh, we have to all keep that in mind that uh, if you've had success in this life, you've had luck somewhere along the way. And yeah, hard work is a big part of it. But 
luck is a big factor and uh, and you have to keep that in mind when you think about those who are unlucky and you have to consider that uh, there are others who are trying to get that break and that's why I try to help out as many people as I can. Steve, it's it's been a blast. The last one I'll ask here is we we avoided the Wawa sheets uh, argument earlier. So uh, any any anything you have to chime in on that would be uh, would be appreciated for those that stuck around to the end of the episode here. Uh, I'll go with neither. Actually, <laughs> I'm uh, I'm trying to keep it healthy these days, but I will go to uh, Philly cheesesteaks and Primanis. Uh, I oh, yeah. will get I will go with all of the above on that all right. uh, because I love all the <laughs> I love Philadelphia is one of my favorite food cities and cheesesteaks would be one of those reasons that I think Pittsburgh is an up and coming food town uh, with a lot of different options here. So um, I just got back from New York too, had some great New York pizza. I've got a fondness for all of these, these different uh, signature dishes that are out there and we travel and we get to go to all these places and, and try different things. So uh, my answer is usually all of the above because uh, as long as (laughs) As long as it's in moderation, I'll uh, I'll take a lot of those uh, those great meals. Yeah, I got some good uh, some good steaks in uh, in Kearney, Nebraska, for sure. Back in the day, was there any like spot in Shreveport that really stuck out? There's a couple in Kearney from my first stop where I'm like, wow, I never get something that good. But I, I can imagine down in the south there was some pretty good spots. Oh yeah, like the authentic Mexican food. I mean, real Mexican food, not what we have up here in Pennsylvania uh the and of course the louisiana the cajun food and, and shreveport is northwest louisiana it's not like new orleans so you don't have the as much of the french influence and it's more of like a, a texas type uh atmosphere there in shreveport but the, the great southern food whether it's crawfish or uh, gumbo and that, like all these things that uh, they have at the casino buffets. There's a gambling town. So all the things that you have at the casino buffet, cat fried catfish and, uh, and especially the crawfish boils. Um, again, not the healthiest. And uh, looking back, I, like, I'm glad I was there in my early twenties because my body could withstand that type of a diet. Now, not so much. So as I said, I try to keep it a little healthier here these days, but uh, the, the, the spicy foods and the, the Cajun style in Louisiana, that was all part of the culture and the experience there. And, uh, and as I said, it's a slower pace. I just was in New York, super fast pace in New York. Down in, in the South, it's a much slower pace and a way of life. And that's part of the charm of being down in the South. So for those who have never been there, uh, I would suggest heading to Louisiana, whether it's New Orleans or Shreveport or, or wherever, and you'll get, uh, I, I think, something totally unique in the uh, American experience. and. Uh, and so much culture and so much diversity. Well, Steve Mears, appreciate you hopping on coast in here. Best of luck. Have fun. Enjoy your off season. Uh, I know you're going to have some tennis work to do, whatever may come your way during the off season. Enjoy it. Uh, thanks again for joining coast in. best of luck with everything. Again, congratulations. You just got engaged as well. So that's awesome. Saw that on Instagram, uh, follow him at Mears NHL. I believe that's your, your, you got it. I'm on it. I'm on it. I got it going today, guys. This is you got everything. You got all the details <laughs> down, and uh, yeah, it's uh, it's an exciting time. It was, that's what we were in New York for was the engagement, and uh, and got a couple of other trips planned here this summer. And, and the beauty of it is that this is a short summer, even though we got knocked out in the first round. Everything's obviously pushed back. Like here we are now in June, we're only in the second round of the Stanley Cup playoffs. So. 2021 20, 22 hockey season is going to be sneaking up on us. It'll be uh, coming up here. It's right around the corner. So it'll be a shortened summer and then training camp, hopefully a season in its entirety, no disruptions and back to some level of normalcy. But uh, thanks for having me and uh, all the best in the upcoming hockey season to everybody. Absolutely. This has been another episode of Coasting presented by Flow Hockey TV.